Hi, and welcome to this lecture on migration, inequality, and poverty. My name is Danny Bahar. I want to start by challenging conventional wisdom. You, you might think that guessing whether a person or a family is living under poverty is a difficult task if you don't know anything about them. But what if I told you that by knowing only one characteristic, namely the country in which such individual or family lives right now, that can give us a pretty accurate guess of their income today and in the future, and therefore tell us if they're poor or not. That is a fact. A big chunk of what explains whether you're poor or not is not about your education, your talent, intelligence, ability, perseverance, or many other aspects. They, of course, do matter. But where you live right now explains a big chunk of it. And if you live in the United States, chances are that you are not poor. But if you live in a country in sub-Saharan Africa, chances are that you are. And when we think of poverty as a deprivation of the most basic rights, there is one right that should be quite up in that list that we often forget about. And it is the right to move to a place, perhaps another country, with better opportunities where every person can reach his or her full potential. When we think about other international flows, such as the flows of goods and flows of capital, the consensus there is much broader. Even though there are winners and losers in the process of trade and global investment, we know for a fact that these flows make the world as a whole better off. When it comes to human mobility, the idea of lowering barriers to migration has much more resistance, actually. Migrants today are a very small proportion of the world population. There are about 250 million people that live in a country other than the one that they were born in, and that represents only about 3.5% of the global population. This is a share that is not only quite small, but it has also remained remarkably similar in over the past few decades. But in the context of poverty and inequality, I want to argue that it is migration, perhaps, one of the most important tools that can help us eliminate poverty and significantly reduce inequality across countries and even within countries. And in this lecture, I want to tell you why. Michael Clemens, an economist at the Center for Global Development in Washington, D.C., has convincingly argued that living in a poor country makes a typical worker more than $10,000 less productive every year than if that same person would live in a rich country. Think about it, $10,000. So this means in essence that a lot of what makes us productive is not only who we are and what did we study, but it's the context around us, where we live, our co-workers, our access to capital, the technologies available to us. So given that the majority of people, the vast majority of people, about 97%, live in a country where they were born, this represents a huge lack of opportunity that is defined only by the chance of having been born in a rich or in a poor country. But this is concerning not only to that hypothetical person that we're talking about, but it is actually concerning to all of us. Why? Because if all the people who want to move to a place where they can be more productive would indeed move, then the world as a whole would enjoy from productivity gains that, according to studies, also by Michael Clemens, would account to up to trillions of dollars. Thus, if more and more people would move from poor to rich countries, this would immediately take us significantly closer to ending poverty and reducing inequality, a big chunk of inequality that exists in the world today. But even in the current context, with strict regulations that hinder human mobility and with a small share of the population that move across borders, there are still a lot of things that we can say between the relationship between migration and poverty and migration and inequality. And the first thing that comes to mind is remittances. Remittances are part of the immigrant's income that he or she sends to their families and friends back home. And these are sizable amounts. According to the World Bank, remittances to low and middle income countries in 2019 reached an all time high of $548 billion, a figure that is larger than FDI and foreign aid. In some countries, the remittances are quite significant too, of course. Um, if you take India, a large country, in 2019, they received $83.1 billion in remittances, and Mexico, they received $38.5 billion. But for some smaller countries with large diasporas, remittances are a big part of the economy. In Haiti, for instance, remittances account for 
percent of the GDP, and in South Sudan, about 34.1 percent of the GDP. And remittances are naturally a direct way through which migration can alleviate poverty and reduce inequality in their home countries. Why? Because when immigrants send money to their families and friends back home, those households can afford to consume more, which is a critical aspect um, that it, they couldn't have done without uh, those extra funds. And perhaps they could also invest more in education and in small businesses. And this is particularly important in poor countries where poor people don't have access to banks and financing and credits. Um, so therefore, by investing more with these remittances, they can actually put a lot of people in a path out of poverty. But beyond cash, there are many other ways through which migrants can change global dynamics in a way that benefits both their countries of origin and destination. For instance, migrants create networks um, that facilitate trade and investment between countries which generate further global gains. Migrants transfer know-how and knowledge between countries that contributes to overall productivity. So after saying all this, what we know is that while the act of migration seems to reduce global poverty and global inequality, a question remains. Can immigration increase poverty and inequality within countries? Most of the answers to this question point out to the same answer being not really. When it comes to the countries of origin, for instance, the logic follows what we just mentioned before. Immigrants send back remittances to their families and friends back home, and this creates networks of trade and investment, which integrates those economies in the global economy more and more, and this generates economic growth. Um, and all these, uh, the direct effect of the remittances and the effects of the networks, helps families back home escaping poverty and closing the income gap. Thus, when we hear about the word brain drain of talented people leaving their poor countries, it has a negative connotation, whereas in reality, it could actually benefit quite a bit those countries of origin. When it comes to inequality and poverty within the countries of destination of the immigrants, here there's a lot of evidence showing um, that again and again and again, that immigrants ha have negligible or no effect on local wages. Um, and, and, and the increase in local consumptions, the skills that immigrants bring, their entrepreneurial spirit often actually drive the generation of new jobs in the receiving countries, uh, which offset any negative effect that immigrants could have on local wages based on the most basic economic frameworks. So if wages aren't really affected, there should not be any effect of poverty on locals. And examples of these thriving diaspora communities exist everywhere, uh, in which they create jobs and they foster local economic growth. For instance, the immigration of European scientists to the US after World War II, the immigration from the Soviet former Union um, citizens to Israel in the 1990s, the Lebanese and Indian and Chinese diasporas in several regions, such as the Americas, Africa, and the Middle East. They all contribute significantly to local economic growth. And while some migrants might be considered poor in their receiving countries, thus perhaps shifting the income distribution, the evidence actually shows that in rich countries, there are often too many other migrants that come at the top uh, of the income distribution, so that in net, there's really no persistent effect of within country inequality in the receiving countries of the immigrants. A few more points before we wrap up. An important distinction to be made when discussing immigration is that there is a group of immigrants that didn't make the choice of leaving their countries of origin. Um, they were forced to do so because of persecution, conflict, or disruptive environmental conditions. They are refugees, and of today, there are about 26 million people recognized as such as refugees throughout the globe. And while refugees and immigrants moved countries because of very different reasons and motivations, um, you might think that they are very different in the characteristics, and to some extent they are. But the economic gains that are typically attributed to immigrants are also common for refugees. Refugees are entrepreneurial at higher rates, and they also use their networks to establish routes of trade and investment. Um, examples of these are, for instance, the Vietnamese refugee community that arrived in the U.S. in the 1970s, um, or the Syrian refugees in Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan since 2010, or the Venezuelan refugees in Colombia and other Latin American countries that are flowing to the region right now, and they are significantly um, have the potential to contribute to local economic growth. And in this context, some research suggests that refugees who integrate in, in the hosting communities are also an important part in the process of post-conflict resolution of their home countries, either by forming a strong diaspora 
or if they decide to return, they will bring with them skills and capital and knowledge that could really play a big role in reconstructing their, their home country. So in sum, it is time for all of us to acknowledge that if we are serious about ending poverty and reducing inequality, human mobility and migration must be part of this equation. And of all the distortion of the global economy, the huge barriers to the movement of people internationally and often nationally is perhaps by far the greatest one of these distortions. And as such, if one of the barriers, if, if some of these barriers were lifted, the world as a whole would enjoy from enormous gains. So when we think about the most important question that drives me and many of my economist colleagues uh, in our research, which is why are some countries rich and some countries poor, or why are some individuals uh, or societies better off more than others, uh, keep in mind that perhaps the most underrated answer to these questions is because most people are not given the basic opportunity to be in a place where they can reach their full potential because if such opportunity would exist, the world would look much more different than it looks now. Thank you.